Hello, everyone. Nice to be back here at the Polyglot Gathering, and thank you to all of the organizers for putting on a great show. It's always a pleasure and a privilege to be part of this great event. So today, I'd like to talk about why learn Cornish? Well, that's kind of the pretext. Why learn in language? Well, languages unite people. Again. Oh, no, 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 no. Okay, so <laughs> story time. Originally, I am from the United Kingdom and I have Welsh heritage. And as a young child in the United Kingdom growing up, I was very aware of that heritage and the fact that we had Welsh words littered in our English from the remnants of a language that thrived in our family. It was the language of my great grandparents and they learned English later. Um, it was the language of many of my ancestors and it was swapped for English because of many political, many social, many economic reasons and pressures. And so this is the background I come to when I talk about languages and I talk about what I'm talking about today related to why learn Cornish. 2019 was a key year. In 2019, we had the, in, the International Year of Indigenous Languages. For me, this was a really important thing and I wanted the Polyglot Conference to be part of this and to celebrate these languages. It was something that really struck a chord with me from my history, my family history with Welsh. And I'd always had a fascination with, with these sort of languages that had always been the underdog of society. Um, the languages that had been marginalized, languages that had been seen as minority languages, indigenous, endangered, vulnerable languages of the world. So I was thrilled when the Polyglot Conference became an, an official event under the umbrella of this year, of International Year of Indigenous Languages in 2019. All of this really started conversations. It started conversations for me personally, uh, internally, and also with other people. And actually at the Polyglot Gathering 2019 as well in Bratislava, I talked to a number of people about uh, minority indigenous endangered languages. And I was approached by two groups of people. One group from Australia and New Zealand, the other from uh, the United Kingdom. And they were interested in having events locally on a smaller scale to the Polyglot Gathering and the Polyglot Conference and to celebrate the languages of those areas. Now, to me, this made complete sense because it was the year of indigenous languages. I was already doing that for the Polyglot Conference anyway later that year. And so fast forward to the summer after uh, the Polyglot Gathering in Bratislava and events start to appear in our calendars. So the very first one under the umbrella of the language event was in Melbourne, Australia, and I was going there anyway. So we set up an event in Melbourne, Australia to celebrate the languages of Australia. And it was an awful lot of fun. It for me was the start of a series of events that would, would go on. And we already started planning as well with the people in the UK, a similar event for Edinburgh to celebrate the languages of the Isles. Now, as the year moved on, we went to Fukuoka for the Polyglot Conference, and we did indeed celebrate quite well, I think, the uh, indigenous languages of the world. Uh, not all of them, because there are so many, but we definitely had a good representation. And it was a great experience to talk to and interact with people about their experiences of these indigenous, endangered and vulnerable languages. And I met some people there that have stayed with me and stayed friends uh, ever since. One of them was Alec, who was from New Zealand. And we talked about the, the language event going back to uh, Australia and New Zealand. Uh, in 2020, uh, as well as other events that might take place with other people too. But for me, going to somewhere like New Zealand, where there is one language to focus on and there are materials available to learn it, made sense. So for me, 2020, uh, as we started the year, was about learning Maori 
and getting ready to go to Auckland and celebrating the Maori language, as well as uh, the diversity within uh, New Zealand. We would have another event again also in Melbourne. But of course, we were moving slowly towards something we weren't really anticipating. And this really culminated these language events in the language event in Edinburgh, which was what we didn't know back then, <laughs> the final event of that year in person. The language event in Edinburgh was an opportunity to celebrate the languages of the Isles, all of the Celtic languages, and also the Germanic languages of the Isles, Old English and Scots. And for me, studying those languages and looking at those languages and hearing about them was a great opportunity to rediscover my own ancestry, my own past, my own history, and the peoples that share the islands from, which, from where I came. Now, after this event, I landed back in uh, Skopje on, I believe, the 3rd of March. Uh, I had to, an overnight stay in Turkey. Things were looking a bit strange with uh, a certain thing going on in the world. And I didn't, I didn't know what was going to happen with other events for the rest of the year. There was a definite gray area as to what was going to happen Things seemed uncertain. And this uncertainty that we saw in the world uh, with you know, the, the, the pandemic really did uh, mirror for me and reflect the situation in the language learning community, the situation of these uh, indigenous, endangered and vulnerable languages in that people would often see a black and a white situation as to good and bad, um, positive and negative. I don't see the world in those terms. Personally, I see the world uh, as very much more gray. And, and I think that when we talk about learning these languages and talking about uh, whether you spend your time doing one thing or another, whether it's you want to focus on learning German to a C2 level and then learning anything else would, would negate that. Well, I, I don't see the world in those terms. I see the world very much as you can do bits of both. There's good with bad, there's uh, positive and negative can be combined. And this is kind of where I saw things heading in this uncertainty after I came back from Edinburgh. But then there was a big stop because of this. COVID-19 was officially here. Uh, we were going into lockdown. Polyglot gathering uh, in person couldn't go ahead. We had a first online gathering. All of these things started to happen and it made the reality of the situation from last year until really now, the reality was, was here and it was here to stay and not just for a week or two weeks or a month or two months, it was here to stay for a while. And it would change and turn everything on its head as to how we think about things, how we go about things. It would create opportunities for innovation and opportunities within our community, within our language learning community, to really reevaluate what we can and can't do, what's possible and what's not possible, what's available and what's not available. These things before weren't really in the same way as they are now because of technological advancements, because of possibilities to connect with people in very different ways because travel was no longer possible in the same way as it was before. So for me, the very first opportunity that opened up was when my friend Irena wrote to me on Facebook and said, did you see the North Sami course that's opening up online? And normally this would be in person, and I think it was in Oslo, but they're doing it online. And I quickly sort of shared this with a few of my friends as well. And before you knew it, a few of us were on this course. I think it started with over 100 people, and they never imagined this number of people um, signing up to a North Sami course. And this was really thanks to a very strange situation that was out of our control. And it brought this opportunity to study this language and its culture and its people and to have a window into that world from our home. And I really enjoyed that opportunity. And of course, I was 
kind of in the back of my mind thinking, this isn't going to stop with this. This isn't the end of it. This is the start of opportunities. And it was at that moment I made a decision that I would grab these opportunities with both hands and I would move forward and take the positive out of the negative and flip it on its head. And I would just carry on doing whatever came up. So a course in Scots came up, an intensive three week long course in the Scots language came up for me with the University of Edinburgh, thanks to Thomas Back and his team who organized it. And the course teacher, uh, Michael Dempster, who'd spoken at the language event in Edinburgh just a few months earlier. And I was extremely happy because this was a language that I would never normally get to study. And all of a sudden, here was me learning the closest language to my native tongue, English, and, and enjoying every single minute of it and enjoying seeing the, 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 the sort of the, the crossover with my native dialect of, of Scouse, uh, the Liverpudlian dialect. And I really, really enjoyed the opportunity that I would normally not have. Now, I'm going to leave this slide on because it leads me to another language of Scotland that I got to study over this year too, which is Gaelic, the Scottish Gaelic language. And um, I signed up for a course and decided, you know, I'm going to explore another Celtic language. And my friend Maureen wrote to me and said, did you hear that they're having a Cornish class as well? And I'd not really considered learning Cornish before. Um, of course, it was one of the ones on my huge list of languages, like we all have, don't we, right? And we all have a huge list of languages we want to learn. But um, it was one of those languages, but kind of quite low down. But having the opportunity to do it, for me, was the thing, because it was something I would have to probably wait for retirement to go and spend time um, at a course in Cornwall or do, you know, wait for a while to do it. It wasn't something that was going to leap out at me. So I grabbed this opportunity with both hands, too. And I started learning Cornish. And obviously, with my background in Welsh, it was a language that was related. Uh, so I could take it that bit further than, than say, North Sami, which was a very unrelated language for me. But I appreciated the window into it. With Cornish, I decided that I would actually prepare for the first level Cornish exam, which I will take next month. And this is something that has not just opened a window into a language and understanding it, but also I've used this picture to represent the community, the houses, the people, because from this, I was able to take part in a Cornish language weekend. I was able to meet people on that weekend, get involved in uh, Zoom calls and conversations to practice and learn more Cornish. I was able to find Facebook groups, find Instagram groups, find people on Twitter, find people all over the world on Discord servers to interact and learn more about this language and about the people and why it matters to them and why it's important and to just watch them sort of radiate this positive energy and light towards this language and a nod to a culture and a language uh, that they hold dear and now I hold dear through them as well. And that's the very simple answer to Cornish. But this applies to so many more things and so many more languages. And it's not just Cornish and it's not just Gaelic and it's not just North Sami. It's any and every language that you can imagine on this planet. Let me give you a bit more of an idea of the perspective that I and many of us have. So very often we go through the world and we see the blue sky and the blue sea, or maybe we see some land. And this idea of seeing the blue and it's all very nice and there may be little details that we spot along the way, but generally we focus on the blue and we focus on, you know, the, the main broader picture, right? That's what we focus on. Every now and again, there'll be something that forces us to dip our heads under the waves and look in, in at the water and look to see what's there and what's beyond there. But we need something a bit more, a bit different to be able to do more than that because that's something we can do just wearing a mask and putting our head under the water and having a quick look. To see the real beauty, the detail in the world and under the water and under the waves of these different cultures and communities and languages, really we need to take a real closer look at what's going on. This is the detail that makes up this bigger picture. This is the detail that we need to be able to focus on to see these fish and this coral, all the different colors 
for me, represent the communities of the world. And you see the different colored fish swimming amongst the different colored corals, enjoying whatever's there to enjoy. And we as language learners can be like these fish, going from one area to the other, enjoying the beauty of each other's neighborhoods, of each other's communities. Now imagine that one of these areas of coral dies and turns black. And there's a void where that coral once was. That's linguicide, that's language death. That takes along with it in to a great amount the culture of the peoples. Because language is a vehicle for culture. Language is a is a really important part of it. So together I think that we do as a community like these fish going around and buzzing around the different areas just to make sure everything's pruned and everything is healthy and that those colors and the vibrance of these communities is there for the longer term. And this is where for me, getting involved in the Cornish community and helping with those fish, the black and white fish of the Cornish flag and their community is quite a beautiful thing. You may find your own communities that you want to help uh, so that they continue to shine and glow and be beautiful for new generations too. We often, as language learners, focus a lot on fluency. And I, if you're a bit like me, I'm, I'm quite visual in this way. I sort of see this visual as a dance of light across the sky, like the Northern Lights, weaving between different verb forms and different, uh, different conjugations and different uh, noun declensions and making them all weave together in a nice pattern that decorates the sky. And that's your form of communication. It's so beautiful, but that's just one layer. That's one layer of the language that we learn. And it's fine to focus on that layer. It's fine to do that. But look beyond that layer and you see a plethora of stars and other universes and galaxies and planets and everything beyond. And you can start seeing the detail, the little pinpricks that make up this beautiful picture. And when you focus on a picture, when you focus on a, a star, for example, that can represent the etymology of words, of grammar, of pronunciation, of anything you can imagine in different languages. It can also represent how they combine with each other when two different cultures and languages come together like the stars to make up the beauty of the, the greater image that we see. This is where these small, as some people talk about smaller languages, which are the indigenous endangered and vulnerable languages within our communities. This is why they're so important because they are an integral part of this image to make up the beauty, the brighter beauty, the wider beauty of this galaxy that we look at, the sky that we see. And it also helps that fluency to shine more brightly for the language we speak that are related and interact as our communities always do interact. It's fine to look at the detail of one flower. We can focus in on all different aspects of it. We can focus in on the petals and look at maybe the literature, look at how the language developed. We can focus in on the, the, the little uh, seeds that grow or, you know, all the pollen, all of these beautiful areas of the flower. And we can, we can look at it and admire it in that detail. And you can do that and you can still look at the beautiful field of sunflowers, of all of them together growing in a beautiful field, giving a greater picture of the world. So like me, you can choose to smell a number of these flowers, focus in on the ones you want to for the time you want to do it. But you can also reach out, hold one of the flowers, Take a deep breath in and let that stay with you. Because that experience is part and parcel of the entire experience of learning languages and understanding how they interact in the greater environment, the greater world. And so I believe that 
when we do this, we do not negate the study of a language or a big language or a useful language that we may perceive as such, like our Germans, like our French, like our Chinese, whatever we want to call these useful languages because they're economically viable, because they help us to interact with bigger communities, with a larger number of people. Sometimes the beauty is really in the detail and understanding the detail interacts with these other larger communities and helping to make the details shine and helping to make the smaller community to shine also improves our appreciation of the wider context. And the wider context is the people and appreciating the people and also appreciating you. Thank you very much for taking the time to listen to me uh, talk about this and if you want to reach out to me, you can uh, find me on Speaking Fluently. I have Facebook page as well as Instagram, Twitter, and trying to build up the courage to make a TikTok or two. <laughs> but you're welcome to join me there and ask any questions. I do lives uh, every Sunday. And naturally, I hope to see you at the Polyglot Conference in October check out polyglotconference.com and hope to be in touch. For now, I'm very happy to take any questions you may have. So while we're looking for some questions here, I just want to say that um, this idea that I've been sharing and my thoughts behind it and sort of the beauty that I see, these are things that I've discovered over years of studying lots and lots of different languages. And this is why when people ask me whether or not, you know, you should focus on one or the other, I don't think that the two things are separate. I do think that you can you can study and have a focus on it, sort of a rock in certain language uh, groups or or areas, and then also enjoy um, the the wider the wider picture. Okay, so I've got a question here. Can you give us an example of Cornish that reflects the people? Wow, um, it's a very difficult thing to do. Um, an example of Cornish that reflects the people. I think the tenacity of uh, the people actually and how they get together. I was talking to someone about this and about the difference between certain uh, communities and how they um, help to promote their language and, and, and sort of teach their language to new people and people that come into the community and they're very welcoming in doing so. And there is kind of a a feel of within some of the Esperanto community as well, where you get this, we welcome you trying to speak the language and we want you to do it and we'll help you along the way. And that I think is this welcoming thing within the Cornish community I found particularly um, unique in terms of they're very, very open to it. And even learners, so people will learn the language and they will, uh, they will very openly start their own um, you know, conversation groups and stuff. It could be to do with um, the history of the language itself, because Cornish uh, needed to be uh, revived. Whereas some other language communities, um, the, the, the path is quite different. So each one is unique, kind of like the coral I was talking about, each one's unique. So it's difficult to, to pinpoint, but yeah, that's one of the things that stayed with me. So Luke, a comment, not a question. Uh, stunningly beautiful talk, Richard, you're a joy. Thank you so much, Luke. I really appreciate it, thank you. After learning a few British languages, um, how would you compare them? Um, so I don't know if I'd refer to them as British languages myself, um, simply because British has sort of a, quite a lot of colonial baggage attached to it as a term when it comes to the islands and things. Um, I, I tend to refer to the, the languages of the Isles uh, from where I come. Um, just simply because that takes in um, Irish as well, which is also part of that language family. Um, yeah, there are th the things I found, uh, though, comparing them with the Brythonic languages, like uh, like Welsh and Cornish, there, there's a, a high degree of mutual intelligibility um, with those. The similar thing when I look at Breton now, I've, I looked at something just the other day, actually, in the Breton room, uh, not really looked much at Breton, um, but you can start making out 
things because it's the same language family side, the Brythonic side. Um, a similar thing's true with 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 Gaelic and with um, so Scottish Gaelic and 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 Irish, as well as Manx. Uh, you can see similarities between uh, words and the way the grammar works. Um, clearly, there are there are certain things within the grammar that makes them inherently Celtic. So there's that. And then in terms of other languages of the Isles, like Scots and English, there's a, there's a very an, an interesting relationship that takes place um, in Scotland particularly. Uh, but I really enjoy seeing some of the dialectal forms um, that people would say, or you know, sort of my own dialect of Scouse, where I didn't appreciate how much transfer and crossover there was. And I, I really, really enjoyed doing that and getting into that. And I've learned some more terms as well uh, that actually crossed over from, from the Celtic languages into, into English. And um, yeah, I, I, I like the word galore. I didn't realize that galore was um, was from Gaelic. Uh, galore, which is a, a plenty, uh, lots of. Yeah, there were lots of, lots of cool things. Thanks for the question, Chris. Um, What's your favorite part of Cornwall? Okay, so I actually have not been to Cornwall, would you believe? So this, I've, I've, I've never been, I've been to Devon. I've never been to Cornwall. So one of the things that I really want to do when I can is to travel and go to Cornwall. Um, yeah, it's um, one of these things that I'd love to do. Uh, Richard, okay. Why, what more can I do besides learning the indigenous language to help preserve it for generations to come. I think Sven, I think um, what we can do is make sure we promote resources. We can uh, learn the language obviously is one thing, it's, it's one thing to do. Sometimes that can be a big task, learning about the resources, helping to promote them, talking about them, in, in, you know, sort of educating more people about, about them and, and directing them to the people that, that know most about these things themselves and the people of the communities. And um, I mean, in speakers of indigenous endangered and vulnerable languages are very often very capable themselves of, of, of promoting the, they just require additional amplifiers, platforms to be able to get that message heard. And I suppose if we can do that and we can go down that route and encourage other people, and especially if we meet people as well, when we meet people who maybe haven't thought about or don't know about certain resources, then it's a good way to to promote uh, that lang learning that language uh, through our knowledge and our awareness. And um, I, I, it's one thing I continue, I will continue to do because uh, I think it's extremely important. Um, one of the things I've been doing recently is learning Haitian Creole on, um, on, on Clubhouse. And I've spoken to a few other Haitians who have lost the language and uh, I've encouraged them to join our group. And it's an easy win because it, you're sort of helping people rediscover roots. It's quite a cathartic thing to learn or relearn your your language or a language of, of the past, the language of your family. So I would encourage anyone out there, if if you're aware of languages that have been lost in your family, there's something quite, quite therapeutic about doing that, about learning and regaining and recapturing that language. Whenever I've been to Cornwall, I struggle to find resources, let alone Cornish speakers, uh, other than the odd dictionary or house name. Any recommendations? Uh, Lily, absolutely. Um, so there are actually quite a lot of resources for Cornish nowadays. Uh, the first website I would recommend is the Kesva website. That's K-E-S-V-A, Kesva. Um, and on there, you can find resources for learning Cornish, Cornish exams. Also, please do reach out to me if you're interested in learning Cornish, and I will give you all of the resources that I have so that you can learn, and I'll put you in touch with different groups on Facebook and um, Twitter handles and things like that, and I'm happy to sort of help you to connect with the community. It's definitely there, and it's one of those things that this is why I use this analogy of you can look under this. It looks like it's murky and under the water, and you can't really see it, but you have to go quite deep sometimes to find the real gems with these communities. And I'm very happy to share that with you and anyone else, of course, who wants to know more about Cornish. Do you have a service, uh, do you have advice, sorry, on copying, on co sorry, do you have advice on coping with the lack of resources uh, that we face when learning minority languages? Um, 
yes, I think that reaching out to people who speak the language is is a good start. This year with uh, the pandemic really has been a game changer for a number of these languages because the communities have moved a lot more online um, through having to really. And so there have been more things that have opened up. I mean, for me to do a Cornish course uh, would have been very, very difficult uh, before now. But I think that a lot of these things are here to stay because they've noticed a number of um, an increase in numbers of interested people around the world to learn the languages. So uh, it won't just be this language, it will be other languages too. Um, I know uh, for languages like Mayan as well, there have also been online courses and um, there are courses for other indigenous, endangered and uh, vulnerable languages. And so, so yes, I think that finding people in the communities, doing searches and looking for hashtags, finding out the name of the language in the language itself, and then looking for resources that way and using terms like learn, study, and um, that will help in those kinds of searches. Gareth, nice to see you, Gareth. Thank you for the question. Can you tell us more about the emotional pull of Cornish on Cornish people in, Wale in Wales? People may have memories of grandparents who spoke etc. How does it compare? It's very good actually, it's a good question Gareth. There are definitely parallels um, with Cornish. I mean I don't want to speak on behalf of Cornish people and how they feel because I'm, I'm not Cornish myself. Um, so there's a limited amount, a uh, limited degree to which I can, I can actually answer the question. Um, from my perception and, and, and experience so far I would say that um, there's been more of a struggle to to get Cornish up and running as something that people recognize and respect. They still oftentimes will see um, articles, uh, and there have been a couple this year even, uh, where people wanted to, to take their wedding vows in Cornish and it wasn't possible. They had to, to do it in English. There was another one where um, a, a writer in one of the main newspapers in the United Kingdom um, wrote that the Cornish language was uh, was extinct or dead. I think she uh, the, the, she put it, um, and that's that's an unfortunate thing uh, to sort of negate the existence of of a, of a group of a community and of a language group. Um, unfortunately, that's been the tool that people have used, and that's been the tool that's been used for centuries uh, by uh, one language group over another to exert uh, their their power and uh, their, 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 their perceived superiority and to subject them to sort of, okay, you need to fit in with us because we are the bigger, the bigger group. And so you should conform to our norms. And negating the existence of something is probably one of the worst things because um, it, al it, it also negates the importance. So it's telling people they don't exist and their culture doesn't exist, as happened to Welsh and a number of other languages for many years. The advantage for the Welsh community is that um, it, it did survive um, that um, to a degree. There were a lot of casualties in terms of speaker numbers, uh, but not to the degree of Cornwall. Cornwall suffered from, from all of that, plus um, industry died down quite heavily. People migrated to the Southern Hemisphere in quite large numbers. Uh, there were trains of people that went out of Cornwall in search of work to support their families. And I've seen pictures of these things. I've seen, I've heard stories of these things. Um, and for Cornwall and with the Cornish language, obviously, um, you know, it was described as a dead language for a number of years uh, because a, a native, the last native speaker died, right? So, um, and, and, and with that, the Bible, I don't believe was actually translated into Cornish, whereas in Welsh it was. So there were a number of number of things that sort of impact this with Cornish. But I would say that there are a lot of similarities as well and um, with, with Wales and with the other Celtic nations. So um, possibly a long answer to, to your question, but as you can appreciate, this would probably be an entire presentation. And I hope that I was able to at least do give some do some justice to the to the question. Um, Lots of love from England, thank you. How do you study or improve a language when you are uh, very rarely never get a chance to speak it uh, speak it with anyone? Yeah, um, 
So this is why I also say that sometimes it's not necessarily important to learn a language to the nth degree. I mean, I think that there's a lot of value in in actually language projects and delving into languages and and getting an appreciation for a language sometimes and and just expanding our awareness. Um, sometimes that can just help the language that we focus on shine more brightly because we can we can understand where it's come from or the interactions like with Cornish or um, where, whereas you know I can I can reference my Welsh. Um, similar thing with with English, Scots, my Scouse dialect, similar things also in the Balkan area where, for example, my home language is Macedonian and I learn, uh, I learned to speak, communicate in, in Turkish and in Albanian and also in other um, Southeast Slavic languages. Now, they're not all going to be at the same level as my Macedonian and I don't get to speak them all the time in the same way. Um, but having studied them, and a similar thing with Greek as well, um, it's it's funny because it does give you that additional sort of boost in the languages that you 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 do study uh, because you have this extra background in your head that you can talk about and reference and so sometimes they go very rusty so some of my languages go quite rusty and um, to the point that I'd feel very very shy about speaking them uh, but other ones you find you can get back into quite quickly. It depends how related they are to other languages. So yes, it can be a problem, but I think it's not one that's uh, insurmountable. If you want to learn uh, a language, I mean, I'm talking about numbers that are manageable, right? Um, if you want to learn a language like that, then there are ways and means to make contact. And actually it's become the friends I've made uh, now that draw me back into a lot of the languages that I've that have stayed with me. It's the relationships that and the people, it's you, right, that, that makes the difference. Is it appropriate to promote these underutilized languages in schools? Um, I would say that it's appropriate to, to have them as, 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 as additional languages in the regions, particularly where they are spoken or where, they are, where they're from, um, simply because it gives those, those children a tie to, to that area. And additional knowledge, uh, again, as I, as I sort of mentioned in my presentation, knowing even a bit of these languages, as uh, Catalom famously said, uh, knowing even a bit of a language uh, is still worthwhile. It's the only thing worth knowing even poorly. And, um, and so having a bit of it just embellishes and, and makes your appreciation and, and, and knowledge and uh, your view of the world that, that bit brighter. So, so yes, I think there is an, a very, nice reason to, to to do that. To what degree depends on funding, it depends on uh, resources, but I, I think it can start at some at some place and and uh, and grow, right? Um, is there any aspect of Cornish that was a surprise that you haven't seen in any other language? Um, no. <laughs> no, there, there hasn't been yet, but I am only doing my first grade there hasn't been a, a, a sort of anything that was completely shocking yet for me in Cornish. Um, it's fairly consistent with what I'd expect from a Celtic language. Um, okay. Um, how do you decide when to abandon a language or at least put it aside? Um, it tends to decide itself, really. Um, so there are languages that I will study for a certain time. Like I studied Latvian and and it's a language that I don't hear um, in the Balkans and um, and yeah my ties and my, my relationships with the people have been so sporadic that it's just naturally sort of gone into more of a passive awareness of the language than an active ability to speak it to uh, any any great degree and so I find that happens naturally kind of like how you choose your friends I suppose you know sometimes you don't choose your friends your friends choose you and because they're always in your face, <laughs> you're newer in their face, and you've got things in common and you meet up, then it's a bit like that with languages too, I find. Um, I guess the most important uh, people to converse with in Cornish uh, may not be computer literate, i.e. the more senior age group. Please comment. Um, actually, it's interesting because there are definitely people who I haven't met in the community who are not on these Zoom calls and things, uh, but there's quite, um, Cornish is 
there's, it, obviously it was a language revival okay so it's it's quite different um to say talking about certain communities where it's just an aging population cornish has actually got this this turnover of of new people learning it all the time um so yes, there are always going to be people I have I can't connect with yet until I go to Cornwall, but I um, look forward to that time that I can connect with these people in person too. Um, thank you for your inspiring talk. How would you compare the situation of Cornish and Matt Cornish and Manx? Um, Manx is in a slightly stronger situation just because they have the school, um, Manx Medium School on the Isle of Man, and so they've they've turned out quite a few um, new. Uh, first language speakers of Manx. I think Cornish is a little bit behind in that respect. It's not got the same funding. Um, got to remember as well that, that Cornwall, uh, in terms geographically in the Isle of Man, the Isle of Man isn't actually part of the United Kingdom. Um, it's got its it's got its own government, and um, so it's, it's sort of it, it works in a slightly different way. And the other difference with Manx as well was that when the the last speaker of the Manx language died. Um, as in first language speaker of the language died in the 70s, there were already a lot of very fluent speakers of Manx who'd already documented it very, very well, had recordings of many of the native speakers uh, before they, they passed. And, and so there was, uh, it was a lot, I, I'm, I'm not going to say easier, but there was, it was already agreed on how it sounded. It was already agreed on on sort of certain written forms of it, whereas Cornish, um, to be revived, had to go through a number of processes as to where you would take the form, how you would standardize language, and and that went on for many decades with, with Cornish, uh, whereas with Manx, that was kind of just really settled uh, straight away, um, uh, re relatively speaking, and so uh, those groups just continued to grow, and then they, they built up the school, so slightly different position, and this year actually is the year of the Manx language, 2021, so yeah. Good, good question. Is the Cornish language speaking community uh, readily accepting of outsiders learning the language? Absolutely. I can testify to that because they've been brilliant. I've really loved getting involved in their communities and they've been very, very supportive of me learning my, uh, Mullen Cornish. I've really enjoyed it. And it's because of the people now that I started going to the, the online lesson, the online, not just the classes, but the online conversation groups. I've actually started enjoying the company of the people and not just the language which is a really key thing. And that's why I think, strangely enough, I probably will continue with Cornish um, longer term now. And that wasn't something I imagined would happen. I didn't have those plans or pretensions in the beginning, but definitely would. Are Cornish speakers aware of the closeness of the language to Breton? They are indeed, they're very aware of it and they talk about it a lot. In fact, a lot of people from Brittany come over to Cornwall for the language weekends. There are a number of people who speak both Cornish and Breton as well. And they also make the references to Welsh too. So they're very aware of the wider linguistic context and they reference it and they talk about it quite a lot. And um, yeah, it's actually made, because of their conversations, it's made me want to, at some stage, look at Breton too. Thank you all so, so much for all of your questions and for uh, listening to me talk about uh, this topic. It's important to me and I look forward to interacting with, with you, uh, speaking fluently and at the Polybot conference. All the very best, everyone. Bye-bye.